feel like we've been a little quiet today. I think the rain has sort of uh, put us down a little bit. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I have had two weeks off of preaching. That was kind of nice. But you know, I'm glad to be back. Um, Jen and I were on our first vacation, and yes, we were in uh, New York City. Uh, it's not a place I would normally go, but nonetheless, it worked out we were there. And the one question I've gotten over and over again since I've been back was, did the Braves win? Because I went to a game, Braves versus Mets, there in New York City. And I'm glad to report to you that yes, in fact, the Braves did win. In fact, they won six to nothing. And so in the two games I've been to, the, been to this year, neither one in Atlanta, my Braves have scored 11 runs and given up zero. And unfortunately, they still have the worst record in the National League. <laughs> so I suspect any minute now, they're going to call me up and invite me to more games. <laughs> we also rode around the city on the subways and the buses, which we thought we had a good plan for. But then when we showed up with our little maps, we saw all these signs that said construction was happening. And then if you wanted to take the D train, you had to go to the E train and get off at the F line, only between these hours, on these particular days, and don't get off on the express train, because that'll take you a different direction. We were lost half the time and got the true New York experience. <laughs> but what I can say, that even though at times it was crowded, and at times we were lost, and maybe I'm not sure New York is my absolute favorite place, nonetheless, it's still part of America, and I'm glad it is. And I'm glad that we can all have different ways of doing things. And maybe that is part of what we celebrate tomorrow on any day. So I'm grateful for that. Now, as I was thinking through what to do after two weeks off of preaching, and this new series, what we're going to get into, I started thinking about this biblical concept that I haven't heard anyone talk about in a long while. And I think that it's important because it is very important in the Bible. And yet it's something I think we forgot today. And that is the biblical concept of wisdom. You see, in ancient times, and years ago, there was, these, there was this tradition of these wise men who knew what it was to live life well and to do things the right way. And they contemplated things like justice and, and the universe and how to live well. And yet I look today and I, I see a lot of emphasis on how to live longer and how to live with more stuff, but I don't see a lot of emphasis on how to really live and live wisely and live well and do things the right way. <coughs> the philosophers of age-old time would talk about the highest good, what it means to really live and to be human and to live excellently. And yet I never hear anyone talk about that today. Never. And I thought, why? And so I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at this idea, this tradition of old wise men, and then compare it to what we have in Scripture. So I'm going to begin um, in a uh, historical place with a painting. Now I have a painting on the next slide. Now, this painting is from a guy by the name of Raphael. Not the Ninja Turtle. <laughs> the and Raphael from the Renaissance era um, painted several things. This is his most famous work. It's called The School of Athens. And it was uh, painted, I have this written down, between 1509 and 1511. Yes, it took him two years to paint that. And in this painting, what we have is all of the famous um, wise men in Greek history. Every guy you've ever heard of that you don't really know what he did is in that painting, even though, of course, they didn't live at the same time. So you've got Plato, Aristotle, Epicurus, uh, Pythagoras, Socrates, Euclid, Archimedes, Zoroaster, all of them in this painting somewhere. And if I really wanted to impress you, I would tell you that I knew who all those people were, but I'd be lying. But these were the ancient wise men of Greece. These were the people who thought about the universe and how to make it, um, uh, to understand it and, and do life better. These were the people.
people who saw the highest good and wanted to make the most of life. And, and people back then trusted them to tell us how to live and how to live well. And you have this painting, this tradition of all of these men who explored these concepts. And you have them together here in this painting in a single room. And Raphael, in this one painting, captured that part of history and that desire of human beings to understand how to live right. And right there in the center of the painting, you know the center of the painting is always, usually, very, very important. Because everything in the picture sort of draws your eye to these two men right at the front. And I have a close-up of them, if you could switch to that. Okay. Now these two men are the center of the painting in the most important piece. And you'll see here on the left is a guy by the name of Plato. And on the right is a guy by the name of Aristotle. Aristotle was the student of Plato. And they are in this painting sort of the center of this idea of wisdom. Each with sort of different philosophies, student and teacher. Plato was first, Aristotle was second. And without going into too much uh, detail, um, this is significant because it gives us some idea of their diverging paths. So you see that each of them is holding a book in their left hand. And you can name those books, they are two of their most important pieces. And with the other hand, they're motioning. You see that? So now let's look at Plato, the one in the red. And where is his hand pointing? Uh, okay. Now this is symbolic of Plato's philosophy. Plato is about the theoretical, uh, how the universe is at a high level, um, theorizing about the the, uh, the cave, you know, the shadows on the cave, and, and what's out there in the real world. Everything we see is just sort of an image of what's really out there, this sort of theoretical, high up there in the sky thinking. And Aristotle in the uh, bluish, whitish, depending on the spring you get, uh, overcoat. Where is he pointing? Down. He's looking at Earth. Aristotle uh, talked about getting away from the theoretical and looking at the things around us, the physical things, the things you could actually look at and measure, and things of this nature. So here you have two of the most famous, probably the most famous philosophers, with their competing viewpoints, right there at the center of it all. One speaking to the theoretical in heaven, one speaking to the material on earth. This, the contrast, the center of philosophy and wisdom for a thousand years. Okay, let's get out of the historical for a minute. I promise we're done with humanities class. But let's think about this. Because here we have this tradition of all of these ancient wise men who looked at how to live life well. You have these diverging viewpoints, Plato to heaven, Aristotle to earth. And you wonder today, who are the descendants, the successors of these men? Who today tells us the truth about the universe? Who today tells us how to live well and how to seek the highest good and what life really means? Because I look around and I'm not sure who are the successors of these men. And there are a lot of theories, and depending on who you ask to, we look for wisdom in different people. So my question to be to you is, who do you look to for wisdom and how to live life well? So if you follow one narrative as to the way the history is played out, you can see it right there in that play painting, right? Plato was up in heaven, and therefore, in some sense, uh, was taken on by uh, Christian philosophers to talk about religion and faith up in the sky, the theoretical, and where it all begins. Aristotle sort of got away from that down to earth. And so he becomes sort of the symbol of, uh, say, science, right? Studying the world as it is. And so the narrative might suggest that over time, uh, Aristotle's viewpoint became more and more important. We stay down on earth, the things we can observe, the things we can see, and that this is where now we gain the most knowledge through um, scientific thought and things of this nature. And absolutely, the um, ability of science to, to look at the universe and see um, how it truly functions has absolutely changed all of human life. 
Uh, life expectancy has um, grown tremendously. Um, health, um, babies being born, the way food is produced, the technology we use even out on the farms. All of that has been a tremendous blessing. Then you work into the social sciences. You look at the, the change we've had in government and, and the way that we have structured the economy. And we see all of these blessings in the universe that have come out of good, good scientific thoughts. And we say, okay, now there is knowledge and wisdom. And yet, I suspect that this idea of science and knowledge is not exactly precisely the same as the idea of wisdom in living life well. It's a version of it, but there's something else there. And so, for instance, in one sense we've learned to live longer, but we've not really learned to live better, I would say. On one, in another sense, we have learned to be very, very productive, but not necessarily purposeful in our lives. We've learned to live the intellectual life, but not necessarily the introspective life. Which we look at ourselves and what we're doing here and why. Sometimes we live meandering lives rather than meaningful lives. And so, whereas science has absolutely been one of the most amazing blessings in the universe, technology and all of those things, I wonder if we can truly answer the questions about how to live life well and what life is all about, and why we're here, and what we're doing. Because to me, this ancient idea of wisdom, the wise men, went back to that idea of seeking the highest good, and what living life is really about. And yet I see that not being discussed today nearly enough. And I think, to some extent, we miss the boat on that. So who do we look to for wisdom? If it's not the experts. Well, let's think about it a little bit differently. Let's look at conventional wisdom. Now, if I'm looking for wisdom from people around me, uh, typically people will say, well, the wisest person in the room is the oldest, right? The person who has the most experience. Do you believe that? No. Okay. I have great respect for... Um, for those who have a lot of experience, who've gone through different things in life. And in fact, when I'm talking about the church and looking at what, how are we going to do things, decisions we're going to make, and who we're going to talk to, and how to do all of this, you better bet, nine times out of ten, I go to someone who's been here longer than me, which is everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and we talk through things, and I use the wisdom of our elders and our deacons and our leaders to help me understand how to be a better leader. It's absolutely true that they have been here longer, that they know these people better, that they know this area better, and that I can glean from them knowledge and ideas and wisdom about how to be a person who leads well. And I absolutely believe that that is one of the best assets I have. And yet, I find it difficult to equate always age with wisdom, right? There are some very wise older people. There are some not as wise older people. And so it's not necessarily an equivalency there, right? And so it's a tool, but not the absolute perfect answer to where we go to for wisdom. So you might suggest if older people are not necessarily the wisest, what about young people? Please, come on. I don't even. <laughs> That's not even close to right. I know, I know. I know the millennials, uh, young people like myself, we don't have all the answers, we never will. So then I look around for wisdom and where will I find it? Well, they say, uh, know yourself, right? Maybe I am the wisest one that I could draw from. Well, people have called me a wise guy before, but I don't think that's what they meant. <laughs> so maybe I don't go and looking to myself for wisdom. I know, why don't we look to celebrities for their wisdom? on the world. I love to get on uh, Twitter and see what Kim Kardashian has to say about the election. <laughs> she is so wise. <laughs> I love to turn on Oprah and see what she has to say about life. 
because all my wisdom comes from celebrities. Um, I love to, another idea for wisdom, how about, okay, let's get more serious. How about we look for wisdom in our parents, in our teachers, in our ministers, in those around us who are important and influence and guide our life. Absolutely, we look for wisdom in these sources. Uh, my parents have been an amazing uh, teachers for me to help me know how to live my life well. Uh, teachers, I've had my professors in college who have influenced my life in, in various and very important ways because they have a wisdom and a knowledge and experience that I don't yet have. Ministers, there have been ministers in my life who have spoken to me uh, blessings and encouragement that has changed my life tremendously. And I look to these people for wisdom and yet I know it's not 100%. Because it depends on the parent you have, the teacher you have, the ministry you have, whether or not you find wisdom in their presence. And so it's not 100%. Oh, I know. How about self-help books and teachers? We'll look for wisdom from them, right? Will help us understand how to live our life better and overcome our obstacles? Yeah, uh, you could go to the bookstore and find all sorts of these books to tell you how to overcome the problems in your life. Well, some of those are helpful, and if they are helpful for you, that's great. But maybe some of them aren't. Recently, one of the most famous motivational speakers ever, Tony Robbins, you heard of him, got sued because a bunch of people burned their feet walking on coals based on his lectures. It was supposed to be an inspirational thing to walk across the coals. Well, they didn't quite do it right. They burned their feet. And now he's getting sued. It's not exactly the perfect solution to tell people to go walk across coals and get their life in order. I'm only going to briefly touch on this. Why don't we find wisdom in Republicans and Democrats, one way or the other? Each side will be accused of a fault one way or another. And so we look at all of these things and we look for wisdom and how to live life well. And we say, this is how we're going to live. We look to the scientists, we look to our parents and our teachers, we look to um, older people, we look to um, self-help teachers, we look to politics, and everywhere we look for wisdom and we find that it's not 100%. Who are the successors of these wise men? I still don't totally know. And so we leave ourselves in a very strange place as a society looking for wisdom because we don't have entirely the answer. Now, I'm going to mention a scene in a show that I had to think of when I was talking about this. And the show is not necessarily one I would recommend as a Christian show, it's not. But it was a show on back in the early 90s, a show called Roseanne. And I wouldn't uh, recommend it by any means. It's not a religious show, by any means. <laughs> you guys have heard of it, haven't you? Okay. Okay. But there's a scene that I think I've always thought was really funny. Okay. So the youngest boy, DJ, has heard about faith in God from these neighbors, and they never talked about it in their house. And so he comes to his parents with all these questions about faith and religion. And so he asks, uh, what do we believe? What kind of religion are we? And, and they're sort of very skeptical about this. They're not really wanting to talk about it. They're really uncomfortable. And so the, they say, well, you know, your dad is Presbyterian, and I was born uh, Pentecostal. And, uh, so, and the son, DJ, looks at him and says, okay, now, um, but what do we believe? And the mother looks at him and says, well, we believe in being good people. At which point the husband responds, yes, but we're not practicing. <laughs> we believe in being good people, but we're not practicing. We are so confused as to what to believe, how to be good people, how to live right. And when your child comes to you and asks you questions about what do we believe and how to live right life well, how do you answer that? And that is actually a good question. And so if I look around society today and I look for the answer to um, who are the successors of the wise men of ancient days, and I look around and I cannot find the successors, so maybe I change my question. Instead of looking for the successors of the wise men, why don't I look for the predecessors? Why don't I look for the people who came before 
those people in that painting. The people who explored wisdom before Plato and Aristotle never got to it. Because as I look back and I look in the Bible, I find out that the idea of wisdom was important even way back in the days of David and Solomon and others. And in fact, in the ancient Near East, you can find all sorts of documents talking about what it means to live life well. Hundreds of years before those Greek philosophers ever came into it, discussing what is wisdom and how do we live life well. And so we have a section of the Bible that in, in college we refer to as the wisdom literature. The literature that talks about the idea of wisdom and how to live life well. And this consists of book like, books like Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, Job, parts of the, of the Psalms. Uh, in the New Testament, we even have some ideas of wisdom in the book of James. And so we can look through the Bible and explore this idea of how to live life well. In fact, you've heard of a man by the name of Solomon, who was known as the wisest man who ever lived. There's a story about him. And God came to him in a dream. And I've got that on the next slide, I believe. <clears throat> and Solomon was to become king after his father David. And God appears to him uh, and, and says, uh, appear to Solomon during the uh, night in the dream. And God said, <clears throat> uh, ask for whatever you want me to give you. So this is pretty much a blank check. Solomon asked me, whatever you want and I will give it to you. We'll skip on down, I think, to verse 7. Skip one verse. Now, Lord my God, this is Solomon's response, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people too numerous to count for a number. So give your servant a discerning part to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? <coughs> so in other words, what does Solomon ask for with a complete blank check from God? <coughs> How do I be wise and lead people well? And from that day forth, Solomon became known as the wisest man who ever lived. And from him we get much of the book of Proverbs, Song of Psalms, and other texts. And so, we come to a man exploring the idea of wisdom. And we can find it in the Bible and how to live life well. And even if today we don't ask those questions, maybe we should. Maybe we should look for the actual foundation of it all. So, now that we've set the stage, sorry, I just set the stage right now. We'll do this for several weeks, I promise. No, I Let's uh, go over the book of Proverbs, chapter 1, written by Solomon. And let's see what Solomon says as the foundation of living life well. There's a little opening about listen to our instructions, gain wisdom, do this or that, and then verse 7, which is sort of the kickoff to the whole book. He says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. This is the starting point for the book of Proverbs. When you explore the idea of wisdom, he says that the foundation is a fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of knowledge. Now, so if this is the foundation, the question is why? Now, People get worried about that word fear, right? Uh, we should not fear God, you know. Uh, we should not be afraid. We should not tremble. We should not um, be uh, frozen in our fear of God that we can't move in life. And that's absolutely true. But that's not really what it means. This has to do with respect. This is reverence. This is realizing there's something out there to which our life is accountable. There's something that we should think about. It's not really a fear of hell or punishment. It's a fear and respect that our life is bigger than ourselves. And he says that this is the foundation upon which all wisdom is built. Why? I would say because it's an attitude. Because it's a perspective. Because it's an orientation. Because if I think that my life 
is lived entirely for myself, that I am accountable to nothing, that there's nothing out there beyond me, that I am the biggest thing in my world and always will be, then all of the rest of your life will be built askew if you put yourself on the top. If you say that there is nothing else, then it is hard to find that foundation which makes you build your life in a wise and good way. You build your life in a wise way. Did I say life? <laughs> build your life in a wise and good way. <laughs> it's an attitude and a perspective and orientation that changes everything at the foundation level. That acknowledges there's something bigger than me. Somehow, life makes more sense on your knees than it does standing up. And that's the foundation. Now, not everyone's going to accept that. And if you're not there to accept that yet, okay. I know that people who are not religious can at times be good people because they have compassion for others. But where is the foundation? Where is the humility that says that something is bigger than myself? And is it not possible in doing so to acknowledge that which is beyond us? to order our life in a proper perspective, and to begin the task of wisdom and living life well. You've got to get your orientation right. The God is up there, and we are down here. And only under that paradigm does it make sense. You see, if life is no more than what I eat, and who I choose to go to bed with, and where I choose to go to the bathroom, if life is no more than the air I breathe or the space I take up, then I would say that our life is without meaning and sad and difficult to order. But I believe that we are not determined by what happens to us or defined by the things uh, around us. We make ourselves. We order our life well. We begin with an attitude and orientation that says the fear of the Lord, the acknowledgement of what is beyond us, is where it all begins. It's the beginning of knowledge. So the first part of wisdom is that orientation that puts God above. And that's the foundation from which the entire world will work. The second part of wisdom that we'll get to today is to make a decision. It's a choice. See, the first part of Proverbs is going to constantly, do we call personify concepts. And so it'll take, say, wisdom. It'll say, wisdom is calling for you. Wisdom is asking you to come her way. Wisdom is making a meal for you, inviting you into her house to accept the invitation. Find wisdom and life will be well. It's personified. And then the next chapter, it takes um, folly, or you say the opposite of wisdom, that is, um, not living life well, running after um, violence and quick wealth and all these things. Say, uh, folly is calling to you and she's an adulteress and a harlot in the town square. And she's um, in enticing you and seducing you to come in. Please reject her and do not follow that woman of folly. They're personified as two voices calling to you and you have this choice to make to follow either wisdom or folly. And so um, the first uh, nine chapters or so of Proverbs are sort of a section. By the time we get to nine, this really comes together well. I think I've got that on the screen here. Chapter nine of Proverbs. Page. Here we go. Okay. So chapter nine, starting in verse three, we'll see wisdom personified, just so you can see it. She, wisdom, has sent out her servants, and she calls from the highest point of the city, Thought that all who are simple come to my house. To those who have no sense, she says, come eat my food and drink the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and you will live. Walk in the light. And so wisdom is calling them. But then we go down, skip a couple of verses, and we get down to verse 13. And now we get folly calling to us. Folly is an unruly woman. She is simple and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house on a seat at the highest point of the city, calling out to those who pass by, who go straight on their way, that all who are simple come to my house. To those who have no sense, she says, stolen water is sweet, food eaten in secret is delicious. The little do they know that the dead are there, that her guests are deep in the realm of the dead. 
And so at the very first chapter, we're presented with an attitude adjustment, a perspective that says God is above us. In the following chapters, we're presented with a choice. To either choose the right way to live or the wrong way to live. And if you can get your attitude right and make the right choices, then maybe we will not have the successors of the wise men, but we will have intellectual descendants who seek and desire to live life well, based on the foundation of acknowledging what is bigger than us and looking into the scriptures. I can't tell you at every level how to live your life well. I can't tell you that we can seek after wisdom, we can choose that voice calling to us, that we can make good choices, orient our life well, and live right. So you can still put yourself at top if you are religious, and you can put yourself at top if you are irreligious. <coughs> but to do it right, you put God at the top, and then things become clear. We will all make bad choices, but we can always choose to go back to wisdom. So, if God gave you a blank check and asked you to, said you could ask for whatever you wanted, a lot of things you could ask for. And basically, you got that because you got life. I would say, let's seek wisdom. Let's live life well. We don't have wise men exactly to look back on anymore. We do have the scriptures. We do have each other. We have the Holy Spirit of God. From there, we, too, can figure out how to live life well. We've got a lot more to say. We're going to look through Proverbs. We're going to look through Ecclesiastes um, through the rest of the summer. But this is the opening to think about this idea of wisdom and to live your life in the right way. So I hope that you'll grasp on that, that you'll read about it, and then we'll think about not just knowing more, but living for better reasons. Father God, uh, I am appreciative that it is possible to talk on a deep level about why we're here. Because <clears throat> so many people leave that question out entirely. They want to ask um, how we got here. They want to ask uh, where we go from here. They want to talk about uh, there not being anything behind it. It's just random. And Lord, I believe in understanding more. I believe in, at times, being skeptical enough to understand things the right way. But Lord, more than that, I believe that life has a purpose and a reason. I believe that there's something bigger than me to orient my life correctly, to find wisdom, to make that choice. I have to put you first. And so, Lord, we could look at Plato and Aristotle, and they're pointing one way or the other. We could look at all the wise men of all of time, but in the end, we find it in you and your word. And we find it in contemplating what you would have us do. See, it's not about an intellectual life, it's about an introspective life. A life lived with meaning, purpose, and hope for something beyond. So, Lord, let us be those who live well. And let that be uh, the most important thing. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. This is the invitation song. This is your chance to make a decision, to come down, uh, to receive a prayer, whatever you need. Um, sometimes it's nice to take a couple steps forward and receive it.